Hello fellow problem solvers, so today we're going to be doing a lesson on polynomials. So first and foremost, there's a lot of text here, you can pause, I'm going to read this to you now. And this is going to be the first really the lesson on polynomials and we're going to have a problem that's going to like introduce and we're going to build up everything from the ground up from the definition. So first is the definition. What is a polynomial? A polynomial P of X is a polynomial in X is a sum of finitely many expressions of the form C times X to the power of K where C is a constant and K is a non-negative non-negative integer and we can write this down as p of x is a n times x n a n minus one times x to the n minus one all the way till a one times x plus a zero there's pluses in between here where all these a zero a one a two a three all the way till a n are called the coefficients of the polynomial p we can have a polynomial in that has real coefficients integer coefficients or coefficients in the complex numbers and there's even a way to denote sets of all the polynomials with coefficients in the natural numbers real numbers integers complex numbers and i think the the notation is saying the real numbers i think it's this all the polynomials with coefficients and reals now but that's not that important here now well we we can also assume that a n isn't equal to zero if a n was equal to zero, right, if we added zero times x to the power of n, then just by deleting a n, we would still have the same value for every x. The polynomial wouldn't change. So we can assume that without any loss of generality that the leading coefficient isn't zero. And then finally, we call the degree of the polynomial the the, the actual the what's it called the integer that's close that's near the x to the highest degree that's near the x to the highest power right and here if a n isn't zero the degree would be n of this polynomial p of x and now there are some examples of polynomials for example the expression the square root times x plus three is a polynomial half of x squared plus the square root of three are both polynomials. What is not a polynomial is the absolute value of x, because you cannot write it in this form, right? Because it's an if then, it's like if it's greater than, if it's less than, it's not in this form. A, what's it called? The absolute value of two x, yes, the square root of two x plus, plus something. Again, you cannot write it in this form. The square root of x squared is not a polynomial, because the square root of x squared is by definition, the absolute value of x. And I think that's about pretty much it, what we have here. So, and also one over x, right? This isn't also a polynomial. Now, there are these two theorems that are sort of like introductory. One is if, if p of x and q of x are polynomials, doesn't say what kind of coefficients they have. The only thing is that q of x isn't zero, which means it's not, the coefficients aren't just zero, it can have a zero, then there exist unique polynomials c of x and r of x, such that p of x is q of x times c of x plus r of x, with the degree of the polynomial r is less than the degree of the polynomial q. Now, we're actually going to prove this claim. This is going to be the problem that I'm going to invite you, you know, to pause for about 20 minutes or so between 20 minutes and an hour and you try to prove this. But before we go on, I just want to make clear what the degree is. There are these two rules. What's the degree? And the first rule is that the degree of the sum or the difference is less than or equal to the bigger one of the degrees. Because mind you, these sort of, sort of coefficients for P and Q can cancel out. And right, you know, maybe pause here, take this in because I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. But this is just the definition. This is the definition of a polynomial. Well, now that's a bit lousy. But this is the definition of a polynomial. And from this definition, all of these rules follow. And for example, I'll write now the degree of P of X is less than the degree of P and degree of Q. Right. If it's always of X, if I know I'm talking about polynomials P and Q, and I'm not talking about specific values, but rather all of them, I can talk about 
P and Q in this form, right? I don't need to write X. And the degree of the polynomial P of X times P times Q, or P of X times Q of X, is equal to the sum of the two degrees. Because once you multiply everything together, you're going to get a polynomial. Once you add two polynomials, you're going to have a polynomial, right? Because these coefficients, a polynomial is just sum of these coefficients. When you have two of these sums of these coefficients, you again have a sum of coefficients of this form, right? So that is that. And when you multiply them through, like you may get a mess with like what is what, but it's still a sum of distinct coefficients of this form. When you're multiplying polynomials, you still get a polynomial. This isn't always true when you divide them. But when you multiply, add, or subtract, you always get another polynomial. And it is from here that we have this convention that the degree of zero is equal to negative infinity. And this is made so such that these equalities always hold true. Right? That's why we have what the degree of zero is equal to. Because if, say, p is equal to zero, right? If p of x is zero for all x. And p times q is going to be 0. And then this is going to be equal to the degree of 0 plus the degree of q. And then to make this an equality, we, have, we say that the degree of 0 is negative infinity. Like it either has to be negative or positive infinity. But I think to make it so that this is true, because if p of x and q of x are identical, you want to have this true. And you want to say when p of x minus q of x is 0, then you have a degree of zero it is less than or equal to the max of these. So you take degree of zero to be a negative infinity. That is where these things come from, right? Where, where this convention comes from. And now I'm going to invite you to pause and try to prove this claim here. And here pause for at least 20 minutes, ideally 40, not more than an hour. And here is really the solution. And I hope you get this is what polynomials are. And now let's start the solution. Now, I realize I haven't said what it means for polynomials to be equal. It means that all the coefficients of this polynomial and this one are the same. That's what it means. So if you didn't pause, if you were confused what it means and wanted to work on a problem, that's what equality here means. So now let's try, go ahead and solve this. So let's have P of X is equal to A0 plus A1X plus all the way till a and x to the n and let's have q of x be equal to b0 plus b1x plus all the way till b say k x to the k now to understand this proof you need to understand induction right though mind you this thing is decently commonly used and also just i want you to realize that how similar this is to the euclidean algorithm in number theory that if you, instead of p and q write p of x and q of x, you, you had p, q as integers, you would have unique c and r, which are also in the integers, which is also an interesting thing, that these are similar in some way. And what do we have here? So now we want to prove that there exists a unique polynomial c and r such that this times c plus r is equal to this. Now, if k is less than n, actually, let's do the opposite. Let's do if k is greater than n. That means we already have an bn x to the n in here. How, what must we do to form, mind you, r of x, this polynomial, is going to have a smaller degree than q. And because it has a smaller degree than q, that means this polynomial cannot kill x to the k, cannot get rid of x to the k. So, and we need to get rid of x to the k because there's no k here. There's no k member here, right? We need to get rid of b of n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1, right? So we need to get rid of that. And the only way to get rid of it is to have c of x be equal to 0. That is the only way to get rid of it. And then you have that r of x is equal to p of x. And that is a unique solution. So let's assume that k is less than or equal to n. Because this case is more 
is like where we actually have more difficulties. So now in this case, what are we going to do? How can we actually prove this claim? Well, one way to prove this claim is to think about, okay, let me try to say, do this. How am I going to do this? I need to say, get rid of an somehow. If I multiply also BK and AN are not equal to zero, I'm assuming here. So I need to multiply like the leading coefficient with C is going to be, is going to have to be like some C N minus K X to the N minus K. And then I'm going to have some other things, but I'm going to need this to get rid of these coefficients, to have these coefficients cancel out. And then the rest is difficult. Or is it? Right? Is it difficult? Is, it, is the rest really that difficult? If you fix k and say we've, really all, we've solved this for any n that's less than k, what can we do for n greater than or equal to k? Induction is the idea here, and I invite you here to pause for another 10 minutes and see if you can prove this inductively. Your base cases are n that are less than or equal, less, strictly less than k. Assume it's true for some n that's greater than or equal, that's greater than or equal to k plus 1, and greater than or equal to n, plus, n minus 1, and then prove it's true for the next one. And here's the next step. Well, we are going to need to have this thing right here in C of, for this n, we're going to need to have this in C of x. And then when we have that, we're going to be left with another, if we then like cancel that out and like write C of x as C of n minus k, x to the n minus k, plus some other polynomial, right? Some other say C two of x. Then we're going to have a situation where we need to prove that p of x minus if, so cn minus k, actually cn minus k is going to be equal to, because we want this times this to be equal to this, is going to equal an over bk. That's what cn minus k is equal to. And then we're going to have p of x minus, what, when we multiply this, with q of x, we're going to have c of n minus k, x to the n minus k times q of x is going to need to be equal to q of x times c2 of x plus r of x, where r, degree of r needs to be less than degree of q. Now, mind you, what is this here? This here is also a polynomial. And this polynomial has a lower degree, right? Here, when we multiply this with q of x, we're going to get rid of a n times x to the n, and we're going to have a lower degree. So now the way to actually prove this is via induction. We know that if we call this polynomial p2 of x, let's say this. And instead of c of n times k, let me just write it as what it actually is. It's a to the n over bk. This polynomial, by the inductive hypothesis, if we take this polynomial and say q of x, then we have by the inductive hypothesis unique polynomials c2. So we have q of x times c2 of x, which are unique, and r of x, which is unique, such which is unique in the sense that its degree is smaller than the degree of q, we have a unique polynomial such that this is true, a unique c2, and r of x, and then this is our c2, and these are our polynomials, and we are done, right? We've just solved it like this. And that really, that really, really does solve the problem. It really says there is a unique element, because there, and here's why there's uniqueness. There was uniqueness when n was greater than when n was less than k, there was uniqueness because this was forced to be zero and so r of x was p of x. And then we built up from that uniqueness to have uniqueness everywhere else. All right, so this proves there's a uniqueness and that these things exist. 
Now, this finishes up our problem. I'm going to create the next lesson in polynomials soon. And as always, thanks for problem solving.